to our keynote presentation for our second annual Indigenous Earth Issues Summit. And I just want to make a couple quick reminders for folks who have been able to either be here all day or who would just like more information. Uh, we did run out of copies for our program today, which is a good problem to have, I guess. However, for those who may still have questions or need information, you can visit our website at www.nmu.edu slash Native Americans, and we will have the link for the program up for some time uh, to continue. So my name is April Lindela. I'm the director for the Center for Native American Studies, and it's a real treat for me to be able to introduce our next speaker, our keynote speaker for this evening. Before I do that, friendly reminder to put your cell phones on pulse or vibrate or whatever you choose. I um, can't think of any logistical announcements other than that one. So with that, I'll introduce our speaker. Yvonne Peter is a member of the Netside Gwich'in. He hails from a small mountain village in northeast Alaska. The youngest in the history of his village to serve as chief, he has a long record of environmental activism and is currently the executive director of Native Movement. Coming from the Arctic, a region on the front lines of what industrial society is doing to Mother Earth, Yvonne will speak tonight on an Arctic perspective on the eco challenges facing our generation. It is truly a pleasure and an honor and a delight to be able to present to you Mr. Yvonne Peter. So this, this uh, I'm going to share a song with you, a drum song that, that comes from interior of Alaska, just so that it's not just you hearing my words this evening, but you can hear a little bit of the sound. And, and then also I just wanted to share a little bit in my language as well so you can hear one of the many languages that, that comes from Alaska. So this song is a seagull song. It comes from a place called Minto, which is in interior Alaska. It's one of the very few villages that you could drive to um, in Alaska. I think I've been talking too much lately, so my voice is being lost. Normally, once that drum beat starts going like that, it doesn't stop for hours, three, four hours. And uh, interior Alaska, there's about 42 Athabascan, or otherwise known as Diné tribes. And um, we all come together. We're all related to each other in interior. So at our celebrations, like one I just came from a week and a half ago, where all of our tribal leaders came together, as we do once a year, we have a, a potlatch. And our, our culture is very much a potlatch culture. Uh, we use a potlatch ceremony for, for gathering, for when people are passing away, for memorials, for ending the cycles of grieving that, that we go through over the course of a year once we lose someone close to us. And so the potlatch is a foundation of our, of our culture. And so we have potlatches when we all come together to celebrate. And usually late in the evening after we do the potlatch, 
our culture is a oral tradition culture. So after the potlatch, our people start standing up and making speeches about whatever's gone o on over the last year about the conditions that our people are in. A lot of the elders use that time as an opportunity to pass on traditional knowledge to younger generations and to one to one another. And then after the speeches go on, then the drums come out and uh, the drumming starts happening. And if there was this many of us in the gathering, we'd all start coming up around here and the men would be saying in the center and the women would be standing around and the drumming and singing and the drum would pass from tribe to tribe, from nation to nation and different songs would be shared. And uh, this is one of them that, that's shared when we, when we come together like that. How are you all doing tonight? We're very happy to see you all. It's always good when you come to some place to give a speech and people show up. <laughs> it's also okay when it's just a few too, you know? Sometimes you just, you, you go with what you have, you work with what you have. Uh, a friend of mine says she works with coalitions of the willing. <laughs> so, so when you have people that are willing to work with you on something that you believe is a positive thing, then uh, you take what you have with, with who's there. But uh, we're very much in a changing time right now where these are the types of crowds that are showing up when there's conversations about traditional knowledge and wisdom about balance within humanity and how we're relating not only to each other but with Mother Earth and, and also about uh, sustainability. How do we implement that? So that's a real wonderful thing to see. I've been doing this work for about 16 years and it wasn't like that for the first 15, <laughs> maybe 14. Just recently, um, interest has uh, been stimulated, perhaps by a few different things, which I'll talk about in, in our conversation uh, this evening. I want to share a little bit, though, about where I come from so you get a sense of, of, of my land, because it's, it's different than this land here. By the way, it's very beautiful here. I like it. It's a little warm outside, but, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's okay. That's to be expected whenever you go this far south. Um, so it's funny coming from a place where you could say that pretty much anywhere, you know, and there's only one village that's north of my village, um, you know, and so I'm about as far north as you could get. That village I come from in my language is called Shank O. It means a uh, creek with a steep bank. And it was actually not really the village because our people were nomadic up until the 1900s. And before that, we moved from place to place in different places. and. Even as a kid growing up in Rochenko, oh, oh, in English, by the way, they call it Arctic Village. There's a lack of creativity in that name, I think. <laughs> they got there and said, ooh, it's cold here. I think we're in the Arctic. That's the name of this village. Um, it's funny because in Alaska, if you go up there, you'll see the villages, and some of them have their native names still, and some of them don't. And you could probably guess which ones don't have their native names still, right? The ones that are hard to pronounce in English. <laughs> So, so there's some of us got lucky, others of us got uh, English names. So Arctic Village, where I come from, it's in the southern foothills of the Brooks Range, which is the northest most mountain range in the United States. And uh, the village that I grew up in had about, uh, when I was a kid, 90 people that lived there. We're about 150 miles from Nurse Grove. You can go 70 miles in any direction, walk out on the land, all you see is animals, lakes, trees, rivers. Every one of them, even little ponds, you can still dip a cup into and drink, not worry about anything in it. It's clean water still. Air is clean. And at 70 miles, only in one direction, you end up hitting another Gwich'in village. So you still have to go another 70 after that before you hit a piece of cement. So I, I came from that place. There was no running water, no electricity w when I was a little kid growing up. I lived with my grandfather, who's now passed on. His name was um, Stephen Peter Sr., in my language, some t people call them uh, and uh, in my language, na names that were given to our people often describe something about them. Sometimes someone didn't receive a name until they were a teenager, and it was related to maybe something they did or sometimes a physical appearance. Uh, appearance. And so Tsehotse, my grandfather's name was uh, Beaver Teeth. <laughs> and so, so some people say, hey, it's disrespectful for you to tell other people that that was the name that some people called your grandfather in, in Gwich'in. I said, well, I said, that, that's okay because my grandfather was a funny man and he told a lot of stories. He was like a traditional historian. Um, that's what he was actually. And he didn't speak very much English at all. Grew up with him and with my uncle in a little log cabin, maybe about 12 by 14 feet. 
little wood stove. We'd haul wood from the forest to keep our home heated for the time, as long as I could remember. I would walk down to the river and have two five-gallon buckets and one of those, I know there's a name for it in English, the wood that goes across your shoulders that has dirt lines to it. And I'd haul water up to my cabin. And when you do it that way, you don't waste very much water, I'll tell you. <laughs> you learn how to just, you know, use what you need in your cabin because, you know, as soon as that bucket gets empty, you got to go down and haul another load back up. And, uh, you know, seven years old, two five-gallon buckets are kind of heavy. I think I might have been stronger back then than I am now because <laughs> I haven't had to haul water for a little while. Um, or at least nowadays, we're, we're able to use uh, uh, four-wheelers or snow machines and, and uh, haul, haul little trailers behind them, fill up the buckets. So we bring the water back to our cabin like that. There's a caribou herd that's known as the porcupine caribou herd that migrates up to a place they call the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge on the north slope of Alaska. And when I was young, there was about 190,000 caribou in the herd. Uh, they migrated freely over 1,000 miles free from any kind of development or obstructions or fences or anything. Real free beings. And those caribou came down every year in the wintertime, and they would spread out among the Gwich'in Nation. The nation as a whole um, covers into Canada and, in, and into the United States. And so my people will, are sometimes referred to as the caribou people because we lived off of that caribou herd and we continue to live off of that caribou herd to this day. So as a young kid, I grew up around the creeks hunting, first duck I hunted was with a rock. Uh, muskrats, beaver, ducks, geese, caribou, moose. Man, our land was abundant, we had a lot of animals. And we ate good, those things taste great. We don't have much vegetables because the ground's frozen, but we have a lot of berries that grow up there, blueberries, cranberries, cloudberries. And uh, so we enjoyed, we enjoyed that. Life was simple. It's hard for me to e express in the words wh what it's like living that way of life and not being rushed by anything. Because there was no TV, so we didn't know car races or <laughs> anything like that. And we'd go up when I was a kid up onto the side of the mountain that we called the turn left, which means in our language, uh, tree line, where the tree line ends. And we'd go up there, we'd set up camps, each family head, we'd have a camp up on the mountain and we'd hunt caribou. The older people would, I was too young at that time. And we'd have drying racks and there'd be caribou meat hung in drying racks and fresh caribou meat on frying pans over the fire. And as kids, we'd go from camp to camp and visit the different families and eat fresh caribou meat and eat dried caribou meat. And we'd go down to the glacier creeks that, that run off of that mountain down to the river that my village was on called the Shamdar River and fish for grayling, which is a real sweet tasting fish. It's really good. I don't know if you have it around here. You probably have, they probably have it in northern Canada, I'm sure. But uh, so I got to grow up like that. At the same time, my mom was always very interested in me, and she lived in the city, by the way, at this time, was also very interested in me getting a Western education because she knew and our people knew how important it was to have a Western education. So I was brought down uh, back and forth through the years, and... When I did go to the cities, it was Anchorage, which you may have heard of. It's the biggest city in Alaska. Back then, it had about 260,000 people. And to the city of Fairbanks, which is kind of like a university town, kind of like this, but a little bit bigger. It's about 50,000 people, I think, maybe, um, up there. And in those communities, my mom was a single mother, low-income housing, so it was where all the other Native people lived. And so I got a little taste of um, what it was like to live in the city and to see some of the um, hardships, social hardships that our people faced there. Um, you know, in the city, I was, we would, we'd go to the food bank to get our food, and I hated that old food. <laughs> and so when I, when I, whenever I'd come down there, I'd sometimes bring my BB gun and try to find any kind of piece of land I could find even in the city. And back then in Alaska, in the cities, you could still find ptarmigan and rabbits and other things out in the willows that you could hunt. Um, but I proceeded to do that until the cops told me that that was actually illegal. <laughs> so, so that's, uh, that's actually tied to some stuff I'll talk to a little bit later. So back and forth between those two places is, is basically how I got to grow up. I was recently down in Gila River Reservation, which is in uh, southern Arizona, talking with an elder. And I want to share the words that he shared with me, um, which I rarely do when I, when I talk, but I just felt like it was so meaningful what he said. He said, the laws don't allow us to identify our lands as sacred and interconnected, yet this is the way that it is. And uh, when he said that, I, I thought, wow, that's, there's so much meaning and significance in that statement. 
and it reflected to me how it was that I grew up. Our people grew up with an understanding of the interconnectedness between our people and the Caribou between our people and the waterways, between our people and the land. Not only was there generations of our ancestry that came from that place, from that land, and we know the spots where people were born or the spots where people had passed on for many generations, and there's all sorts of ancient things that exist out on the land that, that we know where it is out there. Um, but we, we had that, that, those, that understanding. And it's really interesting because his statement kind of brings into light at the difference between a, an indigenous understanding of the interconnectedness, interrelatedness, and interdependency that exists between human beings and the rest of creation or the rest of our natural world. And, and then that which has been put into institutionalized in, in Western law. And sometimes those things are in conflict with one another. And that's some of what I'll be talking about uh, today. And that conflict has impacts on us as, as human beings and on future generations. So I was thinking about what I was going to share with you, and I thought, well, I'm going to a university. There's going to be students and professors and then community members that are going to come. And so I decided that I wanted to use this opportunity to take advantage of it to share with you a little bit of the detail of some of the Alaska Natives experience because what I found as I traveled the World 38 that there's actually very little known about Alaska and even less known about Alaska Native people. And that which does get down here is, is, is not, all information, not always information that's coming from the people ourselves who are um, living our, our way of life, life as Native people. So similar to you know the history down here, we had contact coming to us from outside communities, outside of the normal contact that we had with all the other indigenous nations in Alaska, which there are maybe seven to nine self-identified distinct indigenous nations or people. Indigenous nation meaning a unique language, land-based culture, and history, where our languages are not mutually intelligible with one another. It's like the difference between um, you know, Chinese and Italian. Like you, you couldn't communicate with each other. The language is very much different even though we all come from the same land. And by the way, Alaska is a lot bigger than what most people think it is. Um, it, it, it's, you know, it goes all the way in the southern parts, uh, temperate rainforest that stays in the 60s, that's degrees Fahrenheit most of the year, to the Arctic where it gets to 70 below zero, 100 below zero with wind chill and no trees. And so that's the geographic diversity that exists in Alaska in a, in a nutshell. And the types of food that, uh, that we eat as Native people is, is very diverse as well. In the early days, the Russians were the first that, that came over to us, as you might know. And what they were after at that time was uh, sea otter pelts. And sea otter pelts were worth the value of gold in China. And so what the early Russian fur traders did, unfortunately, was enslave the Inungup people, which are also known as the Inungam, or Aleut people of the Aleutian Islands. They took the women and children, held them hostage, and forced the men to use their kayaks, which is an indigenous technology, by the way, which is still cutting-edge technology of this day. Um, you can get them fiberglass now. And, um, and sent them out to get the sea otter pelts for them. And then the Russians laid claim in Europe, because this was what was going on at that time in history. European nations were going around the world saying, this is mine, and uh, sticking a flag in it. I was going to bring my Gucci Nation flag and claim this place, but I forgot it. So. <laughs> Maybe next time I'll remember it, though. Um, I like that practice, you know. But uh, I figure one day maybe we'll all be indigenous land if we had enough flags. But um, anyway, so Russia claimed that they owned us. Of course, there was no conversation with Alaska Native people whatsoever. They held um, limited trading ports in southern Alaska. They were defeated in battle by both the Tlingit and the Adna nations. So they weren't actually able to expand very far in Alaska whatsoever. Um, there's, there's traditional stories of them sending a crew up the Copper River to Adna country, and the Adna actually had a traditional story, um, which was later, later validified by Western European history by the Russians saying that actually there was a convoy that had gone up river, and the guides were smart enough to guide them up river, put them in a place, and the chiefs said that, you know, they felt that something was very wrong with this, and during that evening, they actually slit the throats of every single one of the, the, the Russian fur traders that were trying to make their way up the Copper. Um, not even knowing what had happened to the Inungup out on the Aleutian chain by the very same people. So somehow they had an insight there. I'm not an advocate for violence, but in that case, it may have saved their people from some hardship. And so the Russians had those claims. And meanwhile, you know, 
this is the mid 1850s and then you had the western expansion happening down here of people coming across the plains and russia was aware that the united states was becoming powerful and doing a very intensive westward expansion and they were worried about losing alaska in war because the russian capital as we know is on the complete other side of russia um, then near the alaska border and so what unfolded from that became known as the treaty of session in 1867 which was where in the western books they say the united states purchased alaska from russia for a couple pennies to the acre we were actually recognized in that document the treaty of session we were called the uncivilized native tribes it's actually a lot of fun being uncivilized. I have to say, it's it's um it's it's more fun than it's than it, than it's uh, made out to be as a word. But but anyhow, so they that we were recognized there, which right gave us an establishment in Western law to be able to say, hey, look, we were there. You guys mentioned us in that document that you signed in your treaty of session. So that was one of the first acts, and around 1867 was when the last of the resistance of the. Plains tribes, Apaches, and others were resisting the Western expansion of the United States. So that was the era that is the one of the only eras that you ever hear about in history in World Trade 8 with Native Americans, and the, where there was a few wars, a few battles with the different indigenous nations and down here. And so that was about the same time. So the first thing that the U.S. did was they sent up a military scouts to Alaska to assess how resistant we were going to be as Alaska Native people to them coming to our lands and how many guns we had. What they found was people that smiled a lot, liked to share their food, and took care of them. In fact, there was a chief, Satsui, from one of the tribes where they sent a convoy up to, on horses. <laughs> you don't want to try to ride a horse across Alaska, by the way. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. And so they, one of the scouts cut open the belly of a bear and found horse meat in the belly. So the chief knew that there was something wrong. They sent out scouts across the island and found a convoy of U.S cavalry or something like that, and took them back to their village, fed them, had their women make traditional clothing for them, which is the type of clothing you need to be able to move around on the land, especially when it gets cold, and then guided them up to Yukon River where they met their other convoy and saved their lives. And uh, he became actually the first recognized, awarded um, person in Alaska by the U.S. military, that chief did. Um, so he was actually recognized for that deed that he, that he did. But that's the culture of our people in Alaska, Alaska Native people. Our culture is a very, very welcoming, um, very hu humble and uh, celebratory culture. We also had our, our intense sides. I mean, you can't help but be a little bit intense living through the type of winters um, and hardships that our people had to face. So I'm gonna skip ahead, that was the Treaty of Session 1867. By the way, in the 1880s, the United States quit making treaties with indigenous nations because a treaty is another kind of form of recognition, right? Because a treaty is an agreement signed between two sovereign nations. And so that was acknowledging the fact that we as indigenous peoples here in the Americas were sovereign, meaning having the right to govern ourselves, our lands, and our people. So they quit doing that in the 1880s. Alaska Native people, by the way, oh, I, I should stick stick to 1880 era, actually, because there's another really important thing that happened that I want to share with you. So the Sea Otter pelts were the first kind of commercial item. After the U.S. took over in 1867, a couple of different items became really important. And one was already quite important, which was the whale. Because b before fossil fuels, what was the primary source of oil for Europe and the eastern United States? Whale. Bowhead whale. So they would, there was actually really intensive whaling routes that went all the way from New England over here, all the way down around South America, all the way up through the islands, up into Alaska, and the boats would follow the ice break going north hunting the bowhead whale, which they say used to number over 100,000 animals. They, when they didn't get enough bowhead whale, they would also hunt the walrus coming back down, which the huge populations. And there's the people called Siberian Yupik, Yupik and Inupiaq people that depend on, guess what? Walrus and whale for their livelihood. Between 1840 and about 1890, the population was decimated, they say, to maybe under 10,000 bowhead whale, which the Inupiaq depend upon. And the walrus were 
devastated in numbers. I don't know what the numbers are off the top of my head. But the whaling crews documented horrendous cases of starvation that happened on the islands and among the Nugat people. Um, a lot of life was lost during that time. Also, when they would go ashore to some of the tribes, there was diseases and other things that started to spread through some of those coastal communities. So sea otter pelts, then whales. We're going to go through a track of kind of the commercialization of Alaskan resources and the impact on Alaskan Native people. And we're going to get to the one that I know is of most interest to all of us here in a little while. So 19, up, up until, up through that, by the way, we were still uncivilized. Um, but we were happily uncivilized, I guess. We were living our traditional way of life off the land as Alaska Native people. And even when I was growing up, actually, I should share that my elders were saying as a little kid, we're going to be okay where we're at. We have, all, we have our neighborhood, we have our water, we have our way of life. And if things fall apart in the world out there, we're still going to be able to sustain ourselves. That, that changed in my lifetime, though, which is why I'm here speaking with you. But in 1924, the United States government passed the Indian Citizenship Act, which granted American Indian as well as Alaska Native people the right to vote in this country. Uh, we were among the last to be able to be granted that, that right. Um, in Alaska, though, that didn't really matter much because we were mostly just living our traditional way of life off the land, and the frontier mentality in Alaska was to just completely exclude Alaska Natives from everything. There was segregation of the school systems. Uh, my grandparents weren't allowed to own land, do business, or even shop in stores. Uh, there were signs that said, no dogs, no natives, um, on a lot of the, the facilities. And um, fortunately, the Tlingit people who had been trading through Canada and Lower 48 for a while had begun developing knowledge about Western law. And they began to research how we can change some of the situations that were occurring to our people. And some of that research led in 1945 to the very first civil rights legislation in this country that was led by a civil rights movement of Alaska Native people. And a woman in particular named Elizabeth Krakowicz, who should be honored, I would say, at the same scale as Martin Luther King Jr. or others in this country. Because that was the first legislation. And her debating on the territorial legislator floor with all non-native legislators was just powerful. Two years in a row she debated. She won both debates, and in the second year they finally passed in 1945 the Alaska Native Civil Rights Act, which granted us access to the stores, forced the signs to come off of the windows, and granted us um, capacity to start doing business and owning land in some of the urban areas. <coughs> so story, the story, as you're getting, of, of our people is one of trying to penetrate in to have a say in our livelihood in our, in our, own, in our own homelands. By the way, around the turn of the century, I kind of skipped over. We moved on from whale because whales kind of were depleted around the late 1800s. And there was a new fuel that was being used and discovered across the world. And there were people like by the name of, what is his name, Rudolf Diesel or something like that, who created a diesel engine that ran on peanut oil it's too bad we didn't stick to peanuts. Um, and so a transition started to, to occur. And then also gold was discovered in Alaska in a few different places. Whenever you use the word discovered, it means discovered by non-native people, by the way. Because it was always, always known to be there by, by our own people. And so there was waves of gold rushes into Alaska that had some pretty drastic impacts. And uh, that early mining, by the way, in Alaska was funded by Californian investors and bankers and people from New York who were the primary beneficiaries of that mining, which is a similar story, I think, to a lot of our communities where mining has been done. And also a lot of the early developments in Alaska came from heavy investments by the United States federal government. It's hard to explain this to the non-native Alaskan community who believe themselves to be frontiersmen and women who did it all on their, own, on their own and did it all themselves and built railroads and roads and modernized Alaska when in fact it continues to be to this day that the bulk of the control of what happens in Alaska comes from 
outside investors. The bulk of the benefit goes to them, and there's still heavy investment um, by the federal government in Alaska. I think 70% of our employees in Alaska are government employees, something like that. So 19, oh, and so gold was a major, major one, and also timber and salmon. Believe it, before your grocery stores were filled with tuna fish, it was salmon that uh, kind of carried this country through the Great Depression. Is if you would have been around back then, you would have seen on grocery stores the salmon because there's just you can't believe how much salmon are in Alaska. I think something like 60 million salmon plus are caught every year in Alaska by commercial fisheries and sports hunters, fishers. I mean, I guess you can hunt salmon too with a gun because they, they, there's so much salmon. There used to be so much salmon that. Even when I was a kid, on some of the streams and rivers, they say you could walk across them on the backs of the salmon because they filled the creeks so much. It was really beautiful sights to see, and you can still see that in some places in Alaska. So 1959 was statehood. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of historical detail that I'm kind of glossing over just so we can get through this piece because I feel like it's so important because it it, it impacted my people's way of life and. It was the foundation upon which the unsustainability that we exist with today is rooted in. So statehood passed in 1959, and the state wanted access to the lands, and by then they also knew about oil. And that's the word some of you have been waiting for. <laughs> and it was a big deal. It was a lot of oil. The oil industry wanted access to that oil in the North Slope. They wanted a way to get it to market. The state wanted a piece of it to start funding themselves because they had just been established as a state, which, by the way, there were Jim Crow laws against Alaska Natives, so a lot of our people weren't even able to vote in statehood. And technically, based on United Nations charter after World War II, Alaska was actually on the list of places that were supposed to be decolonized. Included in that list were all the countries that Hitler had taken over during World War II as well as many African countries, countries that basically the world was like, wow, colonization is actually a bad thing. Hitler demonstrated that to the European community, which is still very much controlling global politics at the time. And, and then the United States, of course, of course, emerged very powerfully just following World War II and during World War II. And Alaska was on that list. And technically, under U UN charter, they were supposed to come to Alaska Native people, educate our people that we had a right to our own homeland, and put a vote to our people to decide whether we wanted our land back to be able to govern it as our own nation. None of that happened. Um, the United States simply held a statehood vote and said that that fulfilled the UN Charter, which of course it, it didn't. These points are important because they, they play into some of the laws and litigation that Alaska Native peoples have been in and are gonna continue to be in into the future. But they wanted that oil on the North Slope. Alaska Natives, of course, by 1959, we had done the Civil Rights Act, right, in 1945. We had become privy to Western law and Western thinking. And we had realized early on, my tribe was lucky enough actually to have one of the first, the first interior Athabascan tribal, or interior Athabascan college graduate. He graduated from the university down in, uh, I think, the Carolinas, which is amazing. Most, some of us have a hard time graduating from college these days. <laughs> And uh, he graduated way back in the 30s. And they began to educate our people about fighting for rights within the legal system. So actually, Alaska Natives laid claim to about 100% of Alaska based on Aboriginal title, Indigenous right, Alaska belonged to us. That the Treaty of Session did not actually transfer the rights to all the land and resources to the United States government. And, and therefore, we had to be dealt with as an Alaska Native community. But by this time, you know, in the 1960s, late 1950s, for those of you who know federal law, the United States government was in an era that they referred to as the termination era. It's a tough word. They were essentially going around terminating federally recognized tribes, taking away their land, and eliminating Native people. The kind of the policies of the United States government in waves have been based on terminating our rights as indigenous people and assimilating us into being just an, an American, disconnecting us from our roots, our culture, our language, our way of life, our way of thinking. So 
we had laid claim as Alaska Native people, and the federal government realized they had to deal with Alaska Native people because we had a, a just argument for the land claims that we had. But instead of entering into a treaty settlement with us, with us which would have been done prior to, remember, the late 1880s, when they quit making treaties with Native people because they realized that, mm, that this might come back to kick us in the butt someday, which I think some of you tribes down here have used that. Proud of you for that. <laughs> I wish we had a treaty that we could do that with. But uh, they passed a unilateral piece of legislation known as the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. So they put into a title to make it sound like it was a treaty, so to say, but it was a unilateral congressional act. It extinguished all Aboriginal title in Alaska under the federal system. It extinguished indigenous hunting and fishing rights, took our right away to live off the land traditionally. It stole 321 million acres of land from our people. And it only left 44 million acres of land in native control. Two million in control of my tribe, only because my tribe had that first call graduate who years ago said, you need to lay claim to this. And we actually had established almost a two million acre reservation prior to this act being through. And then about 42 million acres to the other Alaska Native people. But they were smart because they had realized that they were having to deal with tribes down here in the lower 48 who had a lot of power. And so there, instead of giving that, or not giving, leaving that land to the tribes, they created 13, originally 12, but 13 eventually regional for-profit native corporations. And they said, the subsurface mineral rights for these 44 million acres belong to these corporations. And your job is to exploit that land for profit for your people to bring you into the modern age and to provide a foundation of economy for you. And um, of course, the United States government celebrated it. It was the largest extinguishment act in the history of this country of Aboriginal lands and rights. Alaska Native people are some of the only indigenous people in this country without indigenous hunting and fishing rights. Yet we are probably the most dependent on that way of life still. In almost every single village, our people hunt and fish, gather off the land as a major, if not primary way of life. It's really a paradox. That Native Claims Settlement Act could be comparable to an act for those federal Indian law scholars again down here called the Dawes Act of 1887. Federal government had done a similar thing down here, also known as the General Allotment Act. In that act, they were gonna take natives who were organized as communities and through clan systems and the way that we organize ourselves often as indigenous people. And they broke up those reservations and said, each of you as a family can get 160 acres a piece or as an individual can get 80, 80 acres a piece. And the rest of the land in your reservation is gonna be seeded off, sold off, given to settlers. That's why you see in the lower 48 checkerboarded reservations where they have reservations that are checkerboarded with land in between that. I think we have some of that maybe in this state. And that Dawes Act resulted in the theft of 90 million acres of land, of indigenous lands here in the lower 48. So compare that to the 321 million acres that was taken from us in Alaska. So the Native Claims Settlement Act also, one of the first portions of that act gave a right-of-way corridor to the Trans-Alaska Pipeline and access to the oil. And uh, so that was the begin of the er beginning of the era of the North Slope oil development, major field known as Prudhoe Bay. That began transporting oil down the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. And there was a big rush, kind of like the gold rush that happened back at the turn of the 19th century. Um, where a lot of people came from outside of Alaska to go to work on the pipeline to put that thing in. It was a pretty huge engineering feat. It was a big success for the oil industry and for the state of Alaska. And by the way, that Native Claims Settlement Act, the only reason we even got that is because there were some young Native college students in their 20s, early 20s, who went to Congress realizing that they had to do something because this pipeline was gonna go through, the state was gonna claim all this land, and that Native people had to have something and uh, they had fought for quite a few years as an Alaska Native community in their people in their 20s to get at least some of that Native Claims Settlement Act through. And they had death threats on their life, the leaders of that movement in Alaska. Um, if you look at the newspapers back in the 60s, late 60s, very racist towards Alaska Native people. The, the non-Native Alaskans were very unhappy that Alaska Natives were trying to claim that they had a right to the land. Um, it was very intense era 
And so a lot of our leaders back in that time, the Nankum Settlement Act, even though it was a termination act, it caused a whole lot of problems and divisions among our people. Some of them did look at it as a success, saying, you know what, the ones who I've talked to, the elders from that generation, say, Vaughn, before that, you had nothing. You know, we were trying to just get in any way we could into the the communities of Alaska through governance structures. But the Native Claims Settlement Act did provide some institutions, some su financial support, and some capacity development for our people. Some of those corporations, by the way, now gross over a billion dollars a year in profits. So they're, they've become kind of major players. So 1980, we had ANILCA. Anyone know what that is? Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act. It was the largest set aside in the United States, I think probably history of protected lands. It created the wildlife refuge systems in Alaska and protected a lot of areas. Very sig significant act. And it included in it what it called rural preference for subsistence. What that was was an attempt for Congress to kind of say, well, you know what? Those natives really do live off the land. <laughs> and need access to those animals to survive, so we'll put in a rural preference for hunting and fishing. But it was very clear not to say indigenous or Alaska Native. They're very clear just to say rural, because in Alaska, the politicians' rhetoric is, we all need to be equal. It's kind of like someone saying, it, it would be like someone, the equivalent of me stealing one of your cars, and after a week saying, hey, you know, I know I stole the car from you, but let's just be equal, and I'll get it for half a week, and you can get it for half a week, <laughs> you know? Um, it's really interesting the way you can twist logic to make it sound like it makes sense when it doesn't often. They train lawyers really well down here to do that. So now I'll jump a little bit more to modern time. Thanks for bearing with me on that kind of piece of history, but I, it's so important, I think, to understand as we go into what we're facing today in Alaska and, and globally. So modern day Alaska, you got a lot of oil development that's been happening there for quite a while. You have a lot of mineral, metal mining that's occurring. Um, a tremendous amount more that's proposed. If you look at the proposed map of what type of developments they want to do in Alaska, it's overwhelming. Road systems, mining, I mean, the map is covered with all sorts of new roads across the state. And almost everywhere, there's a little pile of gold or a little pile of copper or a little oil well that symbolizes what type of resource they're going to be trying to go after across Alaska. Alaska state government is 80%. I think the last time I looked, it was like 86.7% funded by oil industry revenues. So when you talk about f fossil fuel dependency, think about a state government that's a vastly funded by oil industry. And imagine what kind of influence it, you would have if you were funding almost 90% of someone's budget. So the oil industry very much has a huge interest in Alaska. You have the Alaska Native Corporations, which were set up back in 1971. A lot of them over the years secured contracts also to the oil industry. So they're kind of tied to the oil industry as well. So it, you, have, you have a state in a situation where the transnational oil corporations and huge mining corporations that are also transnational um, have a significant say in what's happening to the future of our land and our state. You have somewhere in a neighborhood, just in the oil industry alone, I think of maybe $20 billion a year in profit coming out of Alaska. And I would guess, I need to do the research on this, so if there's a graduate student in here who's interested in economics and the oil industry, maybe you could do the research for me, which I would appreciate. Um, very Over half of that, I would say, probably goes out to New York, England, California, to outside investors, people who have never set foot and will never set foot in Alaska, or maybe even in the United States, and who probably have more wealth than they could ever need in this lifetime at the expense of oftentimes my people and our people, Alaska Native people who live off the land. At a local level, a village level, over these years, we've also become dependent on fossil fuels. My village is lucky where we still use wood to heat our homes. Um, but we use fossil fuels now because we have electricity, no running water still. But we use diesel to keep electric generators going in almost all of the 200 and some odd villages in Alaska. A lot of them very, very remote. You have to barge in or fly in for fuel. Um, transportation is all fossil fuel based. And in a lot of the villages where they don't have wood supplies, they've converted to monitor stoves to heat their homes. 
which by the way went from very fuel efficient infrastructure that we had as native people to very inefficient buildings that stand up on posts that are wood that the wind can blow right through. So you need a lot of fuel to heat them. I had a friend of mine recently tell me that it was something like, or even my mom in the city, I think they spent $1,600 on two months of heating fuel. And so you can imagine the village with an added cost of heating fuel getting it to the village. I mean, people are paying some 900 a month just to keep their home heated. You can imagine that. So there's, so there's um, a big tie of the oil industry up in Alaska. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges in, in rural Alaska tied to unsustainability. And by the way, this part of my talk is kind of the heavier stuff, some of the history, the hardships. And once I get through this last piece of what we're doing today, we're going to make a real transition to some of the solutions and where some of the light is out there in the world that we're working with and working to expand. So in, in our abilities in Alaska, we have anywhere from probably on average 60 to 90% unemployment. That's not employment, that's unemployment. <laughs> so you can imagine communities that have very little, very few jobs. We have, um, as I mentioned, the cost of fuel is very high. I think gas in my village for a five gallon can of gas at the peak of the gas cost down here was $75 for five gallons. So do the math, it's like 10 to $15 per gallon. And it was funny, we had, well, it's not funny, but to me, I have to laugh about it. When we had Gail Norton as the Secretary of Interior some odd years ago under Bush, she came up to meet with me as a young chief. And the media came out after that saying, young chief lectures the Secretary of Interior for three hours, gives a lesson on history and politics and economy. <laughs> and um, they, I told them, hey, I want to talk to Bush too, but <laughs> they never sent them up to me. The media was so much in our favor off of her visit to me. She was there to try to on behalf of the Bush administration to try to push for oil drilling in that if refuge. We were at that time paying $5 a gallon for gas. And about two weeks later, they called it a national disaster in California because their fuel prices went up to like $2.60 a gallon, I think it was. It's like that. When Native people suffer, it's not a disaster. When non-Native people have a little bit of a high gas price, that's half the price of what we're paying for gas, it's a disaster. Another uh, national disaster, that's another, uh, another way that people kind of twist thinking and logic in somebody's favor. So high, fueling, high cost for fuels are abilities. Absolutely unsustainable, right? Very high food costs that are flown in. I mean, a bag of groceries is ridiculous. I mean, you basically don't go shopping in some of the villages because it's so expensive. Luckily, a lot of our people are able to live off the land. In some cases, unfortunately, we have depleted renewable resources. Some of those are renewable resources, by the way, that I was mentioning earlier, right, with the history, the whales, the salmon, the timber, some of those are renewable. But unfortunately, some of those have been depleted, especially those that are closer to urban areas, moose, pop excuse me, moose population, caribou population, and the salmon runs. It's funny, you have like salmon, you have bycatch of salmon, which is trawlers that drag huge nets in the ocean catching other fish, but they just happen to catch salmon and they just throw them overboard. They, oh, they buy catch like something over 100,000 salmon a season. And then they have commercial fishing that depletes the salmon. And then what they end up doing is putting restrictions on native people who live up the Yukon River, Tuscan River, these major river systems, because there's not enough salmon going through. So they tell native people, only put in your fish net or your fish wheel that we're only catching enough to feed our own families through the wintertime. And they regulate us rather than regulating the commercial industries or the bycatch industries. Another thing I don't really understand in Western law, although I do understand it from the way economics run in this world, which I'll get to in a second. Another thing that's impacting our communities now that's very substantial is global warming and climate change. Um, in my lifetime, I've seen drastic changes occurring up there. Some of the stuff you've probably heard about is the permafrost, mainly you, you guys know permafrost here, frozen grifter. It's frozen up there year round, which is important because we have really intense storms from the oceans. We have rivers that are very powerful. And as the ground is thawing, erosion is occurring at really drastic paces. And we have a couple communities, one of them is Shishmaraf, that is gonna have to be completely relocated as a community at a cost in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So we're not talking about little impacts because of global warming on, on some, of those some of our communities up there. We also have impacts such as the fresh water table dropping in lakes, 
that's also tied to the tundra, which is what most of our land is from middle all the way up to northern Alaska. The tundra is drying up. And why that's so important is because we have a, a lot of lightning strikes in Alaska every year. Um, I think right, it just happened to be right when we were, they were releasing the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, which was a study done by the Arctic Council, which by the way, Bush didn't allow to be released until he got elected into his second term. He withheld that information from being released to the public. But once it was released, it said exactly that the tundra was drying up and that forest fires would come, and we lost six million acres to forest fires that summer. And those forests are also tied to the animals and to the wildlife, and to, in the case of my community, female homes. I think my tribe, on the, of the 1.2 million, 8 million acres that my tribe owns, uh, we lost several um, 100,000 plus acres of, of our forests. We also have the impacts on the animals from the sea ice melting. You probably also heard about the polar bears, which is also another interesting case. Polar bears, by the way, were put on, were um, slotted to be put on the endangered species list, but Bush, Bush put a halt to that as well because the oil industry was interested in offshore oil drilling in Alaska, which they're still interested in. And you can't put an animal on the endangered species list and then put an oil well in their neighborhood. And so there's ties between animal protection and environmental impacts in Alaska. So you also have the environmental impacts and pollution on Alaska Lake communities. You have one community, Nuitsik, on the north slope of Alaska that's completely surrounded by oil industry now, if you can imagine that. They did gas flaring for years, and although technically illegal in the United States, glass flaring is allowed in Alaska when the equipment gets so cold that they need a form of heat. And guess what? It gets pretty cold on the north slope of Alaska. So they fire those things up in the wintertime sometimes, I think they say when it gets around 50 below. And in, in Cook Inlet in Alaska, in an, in an ocean uh, oil well, I think it's the only oil well in the United States that can fully discharge its waste into the ocean. They, and the EPA allows that in the Cook Inlet because they say that the Cook Inlet is an inlet like this and they say the ocean water flows like this and they say, oh, it's kind of like a toilet, it flushes itself out all the time. So the oil industry can just dump its waste into that inlet. In New Ixic, by the way, the levels of asthma and cancer are at horrendous scales right now. Um, young people, asthma rates, I don't know what they are. I think the health aide from there was telling me that it was, it was ab above 70% potentially of the children in that community. So there's definitely health impacts to Alaska Lake people and environmental impacts. And then, and then you all know about the Exxon Valdez oil spill. I hope you know about that, um, which was the largest oil spill in U.S. history that really impacted a huge area. So aside from some of these impacts, you also have the social, cultural, sp and spiritual impact on Alaska Native peoples from all this history that I just covered with you. Um, similar to down here, like my mother, for example, was sent off to a Catholic boarding school, and there was boarding schools that occurred in Alaska that, that had impacts. There was... I heard one of the speakers earlier today was talking about uh, historical trauma and how that is passed on from gener generation to generation. And so a lot of those social ills have also impacted the Alaska Native community um, as well. Let's all take a deep breath. Because I'm going to tell you a story now. We're done, we're done with the... The, the, the challenging stuff, but you get the picture. It's unsustainable. It's not necessarily healthy. It's been a lot of work by Alaska Native leadership and people over the years to gain access and some privileges to be able to do work within our own community. So there's a story that I heard. It's, it's an eagle story that comes from the Northwest tribal area. You could say it's a contemporary traditional story. So the, the story goes like this. You guys still with me? Yeah. All right. So the story goes like this. By the way, I'm not really going to talk till 9:30. Just so you know. <laughs> and if you do need to use a restroom or whatever, grab a drink. You could do that. It won't offend you either. Um, so the eagle story goes like this. There was a farmer, not a native guy, walking back to his farm one day. He comes across a little baby eagle that's on the base of a tree. It had fallen off of a tree, 
he knew enough that that eagle was never going to make it back up to the nest and it was going to perish. But he didn't want to see it perish because it was a bald eagle. So he picks it up. He carries it back to his farm. He's not sure what he's going to do with it. But as he's getting back to his farm, he has a little coop full of chickens. And he looks in there and he's like, well, you know, I'll probably have a better chance with those chickens than with me. So he opens the coop and he throws the eagle into the coop. That was that. So flash forward six years or so. Indian guy, you know, Northwest style, long hair, gravy pot on the side right here. He's walking by. He's taking a walk on the border to the reservation, farmland, where he was one of those checkerboarded communities that got sold off during the Dawes Act, 1887, remember? And uh, sometimes I like to act like a professor. <laughs> I'm imitating you guys, for those of you who are professors, um, except for this story. So he's walking. He's walking by the land. He looks over into the chicken coop. He sees an eagle, full, full eagle. You know how eagles are? <laughs> and he looks at the eagle in the chicken coop, and then all of a sudden the eagle looks at him like this. <laughs> That's how I am. The Indian guy looks at him really with a concerned look, you know. He didn't know what to think. He got kind of pissed off, though. But he was, held, he was holding his cool, you know. So he walked around to the front of the house. Bang, bang, bang. Farmer Joe opens the door. The Indian's looking at him saying, what's that eagle doing in your chicken coop? The farmer explains the story. And the Indian goes, oh, OK, that makes sense then. OK, he said, "Let me. can I do something with that eagle? So the farmer says, yeah, go ahead, do that. Do whatever you want. He was respectful, you know, native guy. So native guy goes out there, and he goes in there, grabs the eagle, takes it outside with a pin, holds it in both of his hands, goes like this. The eagle fl goes up in the air, hits the ground, comes back up, starts hopping around and pecking his head again. Oh, man, the e Indian guy just shook his head. No good. So he just goes home. Next day, he comes back, goes to the farmer. Can I do something again? The farmer was like, yeah, go ahead, do whatever you like. See, the Indian guy realized that he couldn't allow that eagle to live like that. It wasn't its path. So he took the eagle out of the pin, and he took it out on the land, up to the edge of a really, really high bluff. Off the edge of that bluff was just jagged rocks all the way down, maybe 600,000 feet down. And uh, he sat there with the eagle, and he said a prayer, said a prayer for it, took it up to the edge of it, held it again, threw it off the cliff. The eagle fell, flew off the cliff, same thing, fell, fell onto his back, plummeting faster and faster towards the rocks at the bottom. As, as that eagle was falling, he saw way up in the sky two other eagles. But they looked different. They were like this. So that eagle is sitting there looking at those eagles up there. Seeing, he's seeing that his wings are just like those guys up there, right? So he turns around. He starts to glide. Soon he's up there with those other eagles. So that's the eagle story. I share that with you because I feel like that's not only the story of our indigenous people here, that's the story of all of us people. That uh, I feel like that we've been impacted in so many different ways. This history of colonization that I told you about that impacted our indigenous people here also impacted all of your ancestors in Europe as well, but just at a different time in a different era and in a different way. And we're living in an era right now in humanity where we are not living in my understanding of a way that human beings were meant to live on this earth. And the way that we're relating to one another and the way that we're relating to ourselves, and the way that we're relating to the natural environment. The way I was taught when I grew up, caribou were put there. They have a way of life. They have a migratory route. They have a way of relating to the land, plants, and animals around them. And they follow that path. 
human beings have kind of diverted and done some really incredible things that, and also done some incredibly devastating things, not only to one another, but to our natural environment. Yeah, I think a lot of the story of what we're living through right now in this moment is an era of reawakening within humanity. I think that there was other eras within humanity similar to the one that we're living in right now where awareness was being brought to us through people carrying messages. Some of them became very renowned. Buddha, Muhammad, Jesus, where they were bringing understanding to a world that they were seeing that was out of balance. And those messages carried such significance and so much power that they continue to this day to influence people's way of life. And I feel like my generation and the younger generation just follow in mind, have a, a very large responsibility to carry. And for myself, I started feeling it at the age of 13. By the time I was 17, I committed to this path in life for myself because I felt it was important for me to follow what I was seeing for us as people. And there's a few things I want to share with you about that. And this gets to the part of the solutions to what we're facing. Because boy, do we need solutions right now. And we definitely need to implement them, which I think this summit is all about, which is why I'm so excited to see so many of you here. So I think I'm going to talk about three areas of solution. One is personal, internal. What's going on inside of each and every single one of us? We've been through so many things in our lives, especially in the indigenous community. A lot of the programs that I run are indigenous healing and leadership programs. Because, I, because of so much of that trauma and hardship that the indigenous community is facing, we carry a pretty heavy load. Some, uh, I think uh, a friend referred to it as ethno stress, where you, you wake up and you're still carrying this burden every day. And it takes work every day to continue to be strong and balanced and grounded as you navigate through the world. Otherwise, you can fall into harder times. So healing is needed on an internal level. Raising our awareness, raising our consciousness, expanding our knowledge, education, and getting to know ourselves. I think so much in this culture, it's overwhelming to me actually when I really think about it. American culture from our K through 12 education system to the media that is put into us every day kind of tries to make us all be like one thing look one way, act one way, speak one language. We even put in the legislation, English only. <laughs> um, rather than allowing for the true diversity the expression of each of and, every, and every single one of us in the individual, a beautiful individual, being getting to be who we are in the world. And I think there is a path that we're on as, as people, especially in this country, of kind of de-socializing ourselves, of discovering, self-discovery of, of who we are, how we want to express ourselves and be in the world. And, trying to, and, and being able to be supportive to one another within that. Because a part of that process is also discovering our own path in life. What is it that we feel like we're called to be? What is it that we're feel, we feel passionate about in this lifetime that we would like to invest our life in? To get to really live life, enjoy it. You know, yeah, I've covered a lot of hard things and there's a lot of challenges facing us right now. But I, but I believe that if we're following a path that is the right path for us to be following, we, we can enjoy it, have humor, and still do the very good work that needs to be done right now, if we want our children to be able to have some of what we have. Personal practice is another part. So it's one thing to become healthier, wiser, gain knowledge. It's another thing to implement what it is that we know. It's not enough just to know, you have to actually practice something. There, it remi there was a story that I'll share with you, another story. This one is of Gandhi. There was a mother who brought a young child to Gandhi. She stood in a long line, by the way. He was a kind of a popular guy in India, if you didn't know that. Um, if you don't know about Gandhi, watch his movie or read about him. He's a cool guy. That's really a great philosophy about sustainability and village sustainability, by the way. It's good stuff. But anyways, in this story, the mother's bringing her little boy. He's about 10 years old. She waits a long time. Boy, hot sun. It's hot in India. You ever been there? It's real hot. She finally gets to the front. She says, Gandhi, I can't get my kid to stop eating candy. He just 
eats all the time. Can you please just, just he'll listen to you. I know it because everyone listens to you. <laughs> Whatever you say, people just do. <laughs> Can we tell him to quit eating candy? And Gandhi sat there. He was sitting in a chair. Come back in a week. She was like, oh, man, okay. All right. Uh, she's like, thank you, Gandhiji. They put G on the end of a name in honor of somebody over there in India. Gandhiji, she said, left. One week later, they're back there. She waits in the long line again. She gets a phone. Gandhi, remember me? Yeah, I remember you. Tell my son not to eat candy. Gandhi looks at her and you shouldn't eat so much candy. And the lady's like, that's it? You made me wait a whole week and come all the way back for you just to say, don't eat my candy? She's like, why did you make me do that? And Gandhi said, a week ago I was eating too much candy. So I think that, you know, essentially the message in that story, right, is is uh, we need to change our practices, our way of being and our way of thinking sometimes if we're going to really be able to make this transition to sustainability. I always joke to people and say, well, the good news is that there is a definition for unsustainability, and that is that it will eventually stop. It will come to an end. The question is what's going to be there at the end and how much devastation will we have done along the way? And are we going to, what are, what are we going to do? So the personal level change is so important. You know, I lived in Alaska, sustainable way of life off the land for the most part. A lot of my life was felt great about that as a person. I married a Navajo woman, moved down to northern Arizona where Navajo people are. There's like a couple hundred thousand of them over there still speaking their language. Most of them still don't have electricity or running water either, and they're living off the land. But we were living in Flagstaff in the city, and uh, I was lucky enough to work it out so that the house that we're living in, which is my wife's mother's house, runs on a wind tower and solar panels. And we used to have ostriches, but now we have chickens. They're easier to take care of, trust me. Um, getting our own eggs, and we plant as much of that land as we can for our own food. It seems like simple stuff. It doesn't actually take a whole lot of effort. It does take some investment. Of, of time and energy and resources, but we could even, we can do it on a personal level, making some of those transitions. And, and I think that it's, not, it's, it's deeper than thinking. I have come to understand that without internal transformation, healing, raising our awareness, and kind of internal making things sustainable and healthy, we're not going to see that reflection of health and sustainability in the world around us. So that internal work is just as important as anything out external to us. So the other piece of it is that external, institutional and systemic change. And I get the idea that a lot of you in this room are working on, working on, that, on that piece. You could make change everywhere. Local is a great place to start. Your own home, your own community. Figuring out how institutions like universities can make transitions onto renewable energies, can start producing maybe some of their own foods. Engaging the community within the universities is really great too, which is why I'm really happy about this summit. It looks like there's a mixture of both university and community people here, which is awesome. I think there needs to be a lot of that type of collaboration. You know, bringing it back to Alaska, some of the things that I think about is where we're investing our resources, both the federal government, the state government, and then even the industries. I mentioned earlier that unfortunately the driving force in our economy today is still greed. It's still centralizing power, control, and wealth among the few, rather than utilizing the abundance of wealth and power that we do have in this country to help make this transition to sustainability. And that really brings up questions around the values that we choose to live by in our lives and that we choose to live with. So in Alaska, a lot of, a lot of that transition is, is a mixture of continuing our way of life sustainably from the land. My people chose to send leaders such as myself out into the world beginning in 1988 because Bush, number one, the older one, proposed opening drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge where our caribou bear their young. And our people said, okay, we can no longer just live out here in our remote villages. We need to go out into the world and let them know our survival is tied to the survival of those caribou on our lands. Otherwise, we'd be driven from our lands and driven to, I don't know where, but into a place of dependency. 
And so that began the work of my people to come out and share why we felt it was so important to protect the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge from oil drilling. That unfolded the tie for my generation, especially to us realizing that these impacts were global in relationship to unsustainability and fossil fuels. Because fossil fuels are a finite resource. And more recently, in the last 15 years, to global warming. Which, by the way, it's such an interesting thing being, having grown up for 20 years now in this work, where 20 years ago, it was like people thought you were joking when you would talk about some of the stuff that I've shared with you today. And, and now it's considered common knowledge almost about global warming and climate change, about fossil fuels, about environmental impacts, about indigenous people's rights, about the impacts that have happened to us. And it's, it's powerful. It actually does give me hope. So in Alaska, there's that transition for our, for our people that we're, that we're working on. Right now, I'll just say a few more words I want to open up for comments or questions, actually, is, is that there's more collaboration going on right now at a national level than I've ever seen in the history of the work that I've done in, in environmental and social justice movements. Collaborations between African-American leaders, Latino, rep, Latino, Chicano leaders, indigenous leadership, non-indigenous leadership, mainstream institutions, grassroots institutions. You're going to see probably this month on April 20th, the first climate change legislation in introduced in Congress. That is a major initiative that a lot of people are involved in. Um, there's going to be a lot of debate around that, around multiple topics, which I don't have time to get into right now in this conversation. But we are living in this time of, of needed change and of implementation of change. And, but it requires us to continue to be active with it, within it. It, it can't, it's not something that we can sit back and it will just happen. We have to work at it, muster up the strength and energy and determination to continue to be involved and build with one another, and most importantly, to celebrate and have fun within it. Because one of those pieces that I mentioned earlier about, I feel, the human experience is being able to have a cultural and individual expression of who we are with whatever we're doing. That's why I began with the song. Just have song poetry, arts, music, all these things involved in what we're doing as we're building a healthier community for ourselves and something that we can be proud to be handing off to our children. And we're living in a moment of healing relations between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples here in this country and we can have a choice to be a part of that or not, of healing those relationships and standing with each other to build something that, again, that will be good for us. And, uh, you know, with that, I. I want to thank you for listening to me. This is probably the longest speech I've given in a long time. And, uh, but I just, like I said, wanted to take advantage of this particular opportunity to really share a little bit of that, of that depth. And uh, for, you know, for the young people that are in this room, I just want to specifically encourage you to become involved. I was a high school dropout at a Mohawk, and it was saying these pretty similar things, probably a little bit less articulate, or a little bit less knowledge, but essentially the same thing, and I was shunned away saying you're a high school dropout with a Mohawk, you know, and you need to go to school or something, get smart, and then they'll listen to you. And um, I persisted through the years to continue to try to have my voice heard. I organized other young people. I did youth gatherings and whatnot, and eventually decided to go to college. They made me get my GED which is okay, you know, it's just a little test. They like to test you, <laughs> let's drill them, test you to see what you know. And um, it's unfortunately, it's usually stuff like who is the first three presidents of the United States or something like that, which they didn't teach me in my village, you know. <laughs> so, but um, anyways, yeah, so I, but I want to encourage you to, to be involved. I, there's a lot of power in the voice of young people and the energy of young people. This climate legislation, I would say, was substantially influenced and motivated by a youth climate change movement that had been developing for about seven years in this country, um, which just had another major gathering, over 10,000 young people in Congress, in DC, and then they lobbied Congress on the climate change legislation. And it does make a difference to become involved. Um, not always at a national scale, but with one another. We influence each other all the time. I think we're not capable as human beings. For some reason, we weren't programmed to understand the influence we have on one another, just by our actions, by our words, by the way that we carry ourselves. And so I, I want to encourage you, even in times of discouragement, to, to 
continue to care and to, to be involved and to have fun with life because it really can be and is a beautiful experience if you allow it to be for yourself. So that's my words for now. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I would like to open it up to comments or questions that you have in the crowd as well. So the question, I have to repeat each question, I was reminded because of the recording. And the question was, um, do I have any plans to speak to our current president? Yeah, and we're, it's interesting. This is the closest that I think that I've personally ever been able to have access to a president of this country. Um, but it's probably not coincidence that he has brown skin. <laughs> um, and he has appointed two people who I know close to his administration, high up, and a third to a new and highest level position that's ever been afforded to an indigenous person in this country, which is the senior Native American advisor to the White House. And I don't know if I'm at liberty to say who that person is right now that's being vetted, but she's a very close friend of mine. In fact, as soon as I heard, I emailed her saying, hey, here's my idea of the completely new treaty settlement with Alaska Native tribes is written out for you. And uh, she emailed me back within five minutes saying, I'm on it, I'll read your suggestions, and if I'm in that position, then we're gonna begin conversations about what type of changes can be made. The two other appointments that he made are, one of them was one of the young leaders that was involved in the climate change movement as well as social justice, and his name was Van Jones. Um, he used to be with an organization called Green for All. He's now a green job uh, position with, within the Department of Energy, I think. Um, and the other woman uh, used to work for the Ford Foundation as an environmental justice grant maker, and her name is Michelle DePass. And, uh, and so I, I don't know if I have plans. I usually go where I'm invited. I, I try not to impose myself in places, but if the invitation comes or the opportunity comes, I have let the person who's probably gonna be the senior Native American advisor know that, that I'm very interested in being part of conversation in regards to legislation and dealing with some of this transition to sustainability as well as addressing some of the historical injustices on Alaska Native peoples. Um, and it really is a pheno phenomenal moment to, to be able to be having that kind of transition happening. You know, I, could, I wouldn't have expected it to have happened, but it's, it's exciting that it has. So we'll go here and then we'll jump back. literature uh, of your people. And also uh, films, documentaries of your family, but more, more particularly I would like to know more about your work, your own writing, and when you expect to have the book published so that we can read them in our country. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a very professionally question. She was asking about um, literature, texts, um, books, and publications in relationship to some of what I was talking about. Um, my culture and then some of maybe some of the materials that I'll be producing and I'm working on a couple of books right now um, that cover some of that history, um, some of the politics and economics and, and then one that kind of focuses, which is interestingly enough, publishers are more interested in just hearing my life story than, than more of the politics and so that may be the first one that, that will be able to be published. Um, as far as text and videos, I'd have to put that into an email and maybe get that to you so that I can get your email and if there's other interest, we can work through this young lady to uh, receive those yeah, later, because I'd be happy to share. There's plenty of DVDs coming out and videos and texts that are tied to, to indigenous communities and environmental justice now that are coming out. So here, and then we'll jump here, and then I'll start making my way this way and then that way. So we'll go this side of them first and then jump there.
Yeah, there's a program, there's a few programs I'll mention. One is at the University of Alaska Fairbanks called the Resiliency and Adaptation Program, where they're actually taking the best of indigenous infrastructure design with modern um, technology and uh, materials. To, and I think they're building their first house. And the traditional houses that were semi-subterranean in Alaska used to be able to be heated just with a little tiny seal oil lamp, the seal oil in it and a little wick that was made out of baleen from the bullhead whale. So you can imagine the humidity is heated and could be low at that, but that's how advanced the technology was for homes. And, and I think that hopefully those programs take foot. That another um, institute called the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is actually based out of Colorado, um, that group has also been doing a, a lot of interesting stuff in regards to um, infrastructure and design. And this is a piece that I didn't mention, but we have the technology and expertise out there. It's just the decision to invest in that. And unfortunately, then to invest in that doesn't mean bigger profits for corporations, which is the primary reason why we don't see that occurring. And uh, so there, I think there's a young lady here. So she was she was asking a very good question about how how because of how high the rates of unemployment are in northern communities when you have transnational corporations coming up making offers of jobs and economic development um, how are you working in a, play, a way to oppose that but then also trying to develop some form of economy um, that's been termed economic blackmail essentially where you have communities that have their their impoverishment which is different than poverty. Impoverished is kind of a forced situation of, of having been impoverished. And there's also a conversation around what is poverty, right? Um, and international level, they say, oh, if you're living on less than a dollar a day, you're impoverished. But in my experience of traveling around the world, some of the wealthiest people in the world live on less than a dollar a day, and they're very happy, and they have clean water and access to renewable resources. And, and so the way that we kind of define our world impacts the way that we relate to our world. Um, and as, as far as the, the communities, it's, it's really a mixed bag. You know, the indigenous community has been through so many impacts of colonization in Alaska, institutionalization through, through the native corporations that you're in a situation where as native people, we have to try to deal with some of our native community who's trying to push for these developments while other portions of our community are trying to resist those developments. And I think we're finally getting to a point where that communication is more solid. And even within some of those native corporate structures, they're finally coming to me saying, what was it you were telling us about with those green jobs and renewable energy and how that could actually make money for us and ease the burden, the financial burden on our people? And so there's actually an interest even from the corporate side of, of some of this discussion. Um, so that that's really where it's at, but it's a very challenging situation to be in, especially when you're a designated leader of your people. Um, it was an experience that I had to go through realizing that I often just speak my mind wherever I go, including in government meetings and one day I realized that I had said a few things that offended a few state aid agencies for providing grants to my village, which are the only jobs that our people have, and they threatened me saying, we're gonna cut these grants to your people if you don't quit talking up about the oil industry. And so all of a sudden as a leader, I have to decide, do I wanna cut the 20% of jobs that do exist on our reservation completely? And my people would be pretty mad because that's all we have is an income. And so there, there's a real tough situation that a lot of indigenous leaders are in, and it's similar to the leaders in Africa um, African leaders who take on these countries that are in really, really rough shape, and either they take international aid that comes with a bunch of strings saying, you know, you have to take gem genetically modified crops, you have to agree to be in debt for 20 years to the World Bank, and therefore you have to, you know, they impose regulation or restriction onto you. Um, it's it, So it's, it's a challenging situation, but, I, but I, I feel like we're at that place in humanity where we do have to oppose some developments that just don't make sense to continue to deepen our unsustainability rather than helping us make a transition to what is more sustainable. And I often let people know that I think that it's going to mean that we'll have to ease up on this luxury of life that we've been living as Americans because we do concern, consume about 30% of the world's resources and we only make up about 6% of the world's population, which is not very balanced. And so there are going to be some concessions, I think, that we'll have to make in our lifestyles. I don't know if that'll have to be forced on Americans or if we'll just do it ourselves. That's a question, you know, 
But like I said, eventually that transition will happen. It will just be a question of, of when and how it happens. So going further this way, then we're going to jump over to this side, which means I'll just have everyone in the back there, and then we'll jump here. Excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, and it's the topic of a lot of the work that I do. Uh, and that's why I emphasized internal work. I called it healing. And it's also kind of tied to personal sustainability for ourselves. And how do we continue to be able to uh, sustain a positive outlook, a positive approach, and be healthy? Um, I came in here last night to Marquette. Late was on a three-hour jet lag. I've been traveling for three weeks, so I decided to sleep in quite a bit, then go running this morning, and then kick back and take a long hot shower. Um, and for for me, I mean, it meant I had to miss some great presentations, which I'm sorry that I missed this morning, especially of the students. I really wanted to hear those presentations. Um, but it was one of those choices around, okay, I realized that my body really needs some rest. I need to be physically well and have good amount of energy in me. And, um, and so I do that, and I've implemented different practices in my life in order to enable me to maintain my own personal sustainability, not only exercising, like I've picked up disc golf, which I don't know if anyone's into here, but it's a very fun game. It makes you hike, it makes you throw your arm out, and, um, and, I, and hiking and running um, just on a physical level. And then, then also I take time, so I don't let myself sit at a computer for eight hours a day. Um, max max time probably is like four hours for me in a day that I'll sit at a computer and I'll mix it up with brainstorming or just doing something else other than that. And so over the years, I, I realized what was unsustainable for me, where I started getting really out of shape physically, didn't have the same amount of energy that I normally had. And so I started to make those changes in my life, kind of like Gandhi quitting eating so much candy. For the, <laughs> except for I'm not doing it for any kid. <laughs> I'm doing it because I want to live to be an old man. And, and I realized that I needed to make some of those changes. And I think for every one of us, you know, and that interconnectivity of that in our capacity to do things is so intimate. And I've realized that, how well my mind functions and, and, and thinks, how clear my voice can be, and, and messages, how they come across are all tied to how well I'm treating myself. And a friend of mine recently said, you know, how we re respect ourselves defines ourselves. And I, I believe that's true. My wife sometimes says, how do you find an hour every day to go jogging or hiking or play pool or disc golf? And I'm like, it's a choice. You know, I choose to do that because it allows me to maintain mental sanity in, in, in the work that I carry. But I still have my moments of unsustainability as well. But it's a, it's a great question. I think um, each of us feels that, especially because of how much is happening. Sometimes we get overwhelmed, like, wow, it's just too much. Like, how can I handle that? And the trick to that question is you don't have to handle it. <laughs> That's why I was emphasizing, I think, the important piece is for us to be finding out what our own calling is, how we can both make the biggest impact for ourselves in our own life and find out what our calling is. And, and it's different for every person. I'm jealous of musicians. I'm like, man, I wish I could have been a musician. That would have been awesome just to get to play music all the time and tell jokes and engage people in dancing, you know? Like, that would have been a great life, but that wasn't my calling. Um, it was to be a traditional leader among our people, and I accepted that at a young age, and um, uh, and it feels right to me. It feels like this is what I'm supposed to be doing in this lifetime. So, um, other questions? Yeah, so he's bringing up that, um, you know, the imaginary line, <laughs> as we call it, especially in my country. Like, you get up into the Arctic in northern Alaska, and you're out in the woods on a river, and all of a sudden you're, like, in Canada <laughs> instead of in the United States. Um, I've actually done that, gone turbulent hunting, ended up in Old Crow, which is in Canada. Wanted to fly back to Arctic Village because I didn't have the time to go by land because it's a multi-day trip, and I had to go back to my tribe. And the Canadian, Royal Canadian Mounties wouldn't allow me to fly from Old Crow back into Fairbanks and up to my village. 
um, unless I had U.S. identification. This was before 9-11. And or was it? I, I can't remember. But it, um, they, my tribe had to actually go into my cabin, find my Alaska driver's license, send it to U.S. Aid inspections in Fairbanks before the Royal Mount County Police would allow me to fly to Fairbanks to meet my ID to prove that I was a U.S. citizen to go back to my village. So it's, it's, it's an, a very interesting thing to... Um, th to have a people that have been divided by two colonial governments and very different policies on the Canadian side than the United States side. That's a whole other conversation to talk about the differences there. Um, the Canadian government um, has put a lot more money into their tribes than the United States government has. But it's really interesting. We're like some of the most impoverished people in the world, and we come from the richest state and the richest country in the world as Alaska people. And it's, just, it's again, another one of those. I have to tell my own people, man, we should be like Saudi Arabians, if anything. We should have we should have banks right now. <laughs> we should we should have solar villages, like solar airplanes flying us around. Um, you know, you know. Instead, we don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not using that as an example. I'm just saying that oh, at least over there, the native people from that land have some of the resources. Although it, it is a stratified society that's not necessarily healthy and. And in Alaska, because of the native corporate structure, we also have a stratified class structure now that we never had before historically, where we have an upper class of Alaska Native people, there are very few, a middle and a lower class. We never had that before in our history because our culture is, our culture is wealthy is defined by how much you give. So our culture is wealth is defined by how much you give, and that was part of the potlatch ceremony, where at the potlatch, if you amassed a lot, you gave it away. And the people who were able to give away the most of their potlatch were honored because they were like, well, that's a wealthy person. They were able to give away a lot of stuff this year, you know, and they gave away everything, you know, or almost everything. They would keep a few things maybe for themselves. And so wealth is defined by how much you gave to society. So some of those values are kind of inverted than the values that we're living from today. And another value that's really important in that that I didn't emphasize is community. American culture has emphasized the individual um, and even the individual family. So a lot of times families aren't even connected to generation to generation of their family. You're like, you know, once the kid's 18, you're like, get out of the door, you know, <laughs> and uh, go do your own thing. And and I think part of this transition to sustainability is rebuilding community, finding people in the community, building strong relationships with them, learn what it's going to take to share resources and share capacity, whether it's through community gardens or even sharing of financial resources, which happens a lot in the Native community. It's it's not really spoken about, but like my income is really like my wife's income and my wife's family's income and my family's income in Alaska. So our all of our incomes are tied to each other. It's it's very different than than I think the way that Western money moves in families. Like if, if I understand it correctly, it pretty much just stays with one person. They're like, no, I earn this money, <laughs> sort of thing, which is very different the way resources flow. Um, is there any more questions on this side before we move here? Okay, we'll come back if there are any. If you want to come up, so we'll jump to this side. We'll kind of go from the front back. We'll, we'll do that. So. So let me make sure I got the first question correct. So the first question was, for low-income communities that are non-Indigenous, oh, okay, and so is there is there use for the type of knowledge I have of how it works to live in, in community, essentially, yeah. economically? Um, I would say absolutely. One of the most interesting uh, requests I've had was I got, there was, there's a group of, I think, like 50 scientists worldwide that are talking about developing like a colony on Mars. And so these are like scientists dealing with like creating a dome and the technology that would be required to have fresh air being produced and enclosed water recycling programs and all sorts of crazy stuff. And they emailed me and they said, we need your expertise. And I was like, I'm not a scientist, you know, and I don't know if you guys are a new age group or, a, you know, cult or what you are. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 we're a group of scientists globally doing this. And we realized that none of us know what will actually unfold when we stick 200 people in a closed housing with each other and have them live with each other over generations, um, how they'll get along with each other. 
we think conflict will arise. We don't know how to do intermarriage where it won't be incest. Um, and at that point, I realized, I told him that I don't have time for that, but, but it did make me realize that in our clan systems, we understood what it took to, to be able to have marriage in small communities where what didn't result in, in problems occurring. And so the clan systems usually uh, separated community in a way that enabled you not to marry anyone that was closer than a fourth cousin, which in Western scientific um, studies show that that distance on is an allowable area uh, range to be able to have marriage and not end up with problems in, in breeding with, within humanity. That's a small example, but other examples of conflict resolution in small communities are real important as well, that we definitely have conflict resolution that has developed from indigenous ways of relating to each other within our communities. So, I, so the answer to that question is yes, I think that there's definitely knowledge that is contained within, within indigenous communities that have been making it by on less um, economic levels um, that could really help um, other communities. But I also feel like Low-income communities in in this country really are are in a similarly challenging situation to to a lot of the indigenous communities, um, where they're they're isolated, not a lot of access, and not a lot of support. And so, we really do, as a society, need to think about what it's going to take to get um, the type of resources and support for those communities to en enable them to really begin to flourish. And I think some of that is tied to the way that we relate to our land, which is a whole other conversation. But the Western idea is that we own the land, which is different than uh, indigenous understandings that I grew up with. Um, in my reservation, no one would ever say that we own the land unless they're talking to a non-native person um, because they understand that. But anyone who was born into my tribe has the right to build a home anywhere in our traditional lands. They just need to get it cleared through the chief. And they don't need to buy it. They don't need to get a paper for it. They don't need anything like that. You know, the, they come to the chief and council and they say, I want to build a land up, uh, a house up on that hill. And the chief and council say, yeah, that's a good spot. Go for it. And that person goes out, you know, gets their wood, builds their house, and they have their own home. And so it's a, it's a different way of relating to the, the land where it allows people to actually provide for themselves if they have the will to do that. Um, and then as far as the question about astronomy, um, I think our people were looking at the stars, yeah, over the over the years, and there's definitely um, beliefs, and it's very diverse indigenous peoples in Alaska, um, and the relationship and our understandings of how we relate to the universe, including the the, the skies. Um, and I, I'll just tell you a, a little a little piece of one because I'm not going to go into that conversation really too deeply because a lot of that is just knowledge that we don't typically share anyways. But for example, the Northern Lights, which you could probably get here, do you? Um, like when I was growing up as a child, you would not ever be allowed to, and we're in the triangle of the Northern Lights highest concentration in my village actually. They have a little station that is there monitoring them. That used to be my job. Go there once a week, take out a little disc and mail it to the University Geophysical Institute. They put in a new disc, they record, they record it. But um, is that you would never whistle because they said if you whistled at the night when the Northern Lights were up, that she would come down and scoop you up and carry you away. And we believed that. <laughs> when we were, when, I mean, when we were kids, we'd be walking through the village and like someone would be like, <laughs> we'd be like, ah, what did that? You know, and we'd be just <laughs> cruising. So, so definitely there, were, there was a whole system of beliefs and relationship and, and reasoning behind all of those beliefs as well. Um, so any other questions on this one? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, they would just, they would refer to them as baby girl, you know, or in my language, just like little one. Um, and that, that would be the reference point. Or they would be calling them something, and then they would do something. Like there is sometimes 
there's a story of one of my ancestors seven generations ago who there was a time of, of real intense cold in the caribou were a long ways off and they had to leave some elders behind the elders were basically starving there's a great book called two old women that's about that's a really international renowned book it's very short um, and it was written by a Gwich'in woman about our elders and starvation that sometimes comes sometimes occurred but um, one of my ancestors who was way out there on the land, he was a young boy, about 13, they got caribou, and there was an unborn baby calf inside the, the belly. Um, chiki is how we would refer to it in my language. And in our culture, they say young men can't eat unborn baby calves in the stomach of caribou if they're caught. Because they say if we eat them, our muscles and our bodies will go to jelly and will be useless. And so those were always carried to the elders. At 13, he decided that he wanted to carry that unborn baby calf all the way back to the elders that were, you know, maybe 50, 60 miles away at that point. So he did. He ran all the way back on snowshoes, and he brought it to him. And as he was coming, um, one of the elders said, Chikiyoka, to the other elders, saying, he's bringing an unborn baby calf to us. And that became his name. And it was an honorable name to have because it was given by the elders for providing for them. And so that's like some of the stories. So the names were given at that point. And he, I don't, no one even knows what his name was before that. No one knows what he was called because it was so many generations ago. But you just know him by the name that he was honored with at that time. So it's not unusual. I've, I've been at things where a 60-year-old man got a new name. And, and he's referred to by that name. So our, our, cul our culture is different about names. It was a good, great question. Any others on this side? Otherwise, there's one more hand, I think, up over there by somebody. Oh, great. Okay. Are there any more last questions before we pull the evening to a, to a close? Oh, yeah. Um, I forgot I didn't introduce myself in English at all. Um, so the, the story of my name is really long, my long name, but the name that I'm known by is Yvonne Peter, and Yvonne comes through my Jewish ancestry on my grandfather's side, and so they wanted me to have some piece of his legacy, and uh, the Russians came through Alaska, and so in Alaska you actually find, there's a guy named Peter Yvonne, which is my name backwards, and Yvonne came from the Russian influence days, and then in my case, late in the later days, and so we have influence from from Russians, French, and then the United States people that, so you'll hear French words, Russian words, and English words in most of our Alaska Native languages because we've incorporated some of those, especially for things that we didn't have, you know, traditionally. But um, I, and, and that, and so that, and then Peter is just like a biblical name, Christian name they call it, that when they came out to the reservations, in the census, early census days, they were like, what's your name? And someone would be like, you know, like my grandfather might have been Chikyoka. And they're like, mm, you're Peter John, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, you're, so I, I think all across Indian country, there's like a John family, maybe a Peter or Peter's family, a Jane family or Jane's family. And so they gave us pretty standardized names. Um, and in my, in my language, um, there's not really a name that stuck for me. They, I've been, some people call me by my grandfather's name after he passed on. They started to call me by his name because I think I picked up a lot of the characteristics of his personality. He was someone who just got along with everybody in the village and always told funny, long stories. <laughs> and, um, and, and then when I was little, I used to have a really big belly. And so, um, there's a couple words you can use in my language. Chubut is one, but what they did was they just put kind of fat or chubby on the end of my name, so they called me Ivancho. And so, so, and that actually stuck for more years than any of them. And so I was referred to as Ivancho. And there, there's still people that will, my aunts, you know, whatever, they'll, they'll, they call me Ivancho, and it just means chubby Yvonne. <laughs> I, I outgrew that <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Um, no more questions, I think. So one, once again, really, I know it's hard to, to sit for this long, and, and uh, normally 
I would get deeper and they were moving and interacting with each other, but this was one of those moments where I was asked to share some thinking and things to reflect on. And I, I hope that something that I shared was meaningful and useful to you all. And um, really enjoyed you know, the one day that I've gotten to be here and be exposed to some of you and to your community. And I just wanna wish you all the best with whatever it is that you're working on or working through in, in your life right now. And uh, I'll see you again. Uh, Nina Hotya, I'll see you next night.